The generational divide isn't a myth. Young millennials and Gen Zs around the world are not striving for incremental change. They're fighting for more radical policies because they see their world falling apart. From climate change to crushing student debt, young people are taking more forceful positions and they expect faster results. Welcome to Generation Change, where we attempt to understand and challenge the ideas that are mobilizing the youth around the world. This week, we talked to two young people who are fighting police brutality in the US. They use different tools and strategies, but they have the same end goal, racial justice. Flatbush, Brooklyn, which is a diverse immigrant community. How did that shape your experiences? I am the daughter of immigrants, which is something that I talk about a lot. My family is from Jamaica, and so growing up and seeing, you know, a lot of the struggles of being first-generation American. My mom had a really difficult time finding a school within our community for me and my sisters to go to. And so I ended up having to travel about 40 minutes every day to get to school. It was a majority white neighborhood, and so I remember always asking, you know, why is it that most of my classmates are white, whereas when I go back home, my neighbors are, are black or immigrant communities, you know? And so I don't think that I was able to fully understand that until I got older and understood the history of the U.S. You're 24 and you've already graduated from Columbia University where you started a nonprofit for women of color called We Believe and you're also one of the youngest interns in Obama's White House. But you're most well known as the co-founder of Freedom March New York City. Tell me a little bit more about it. I was out on the ground in Brooklyn and was seeing, you know, that a lot of protesters were out and we're looking for organizers. And what you saw was that there was a lot of confusion. And so we created Freedom March NYC. Today, we do the work of making sure that our voices are heard. And it was incredible to see how many people, you know, came together and stood in solidarity. And since that day, we've been on the front lines ever since. You've dedicated your life to the fight for racial justice. Have there been any personal costs for yourself? You always have to make the decision that when the bell rings, what exactly is going to be your response? A lot of people say, you know, what would I have done during the civil rights movement? And my answer is always whatever you're doing right now. I'm grateful to be able to lead my own organization that is black woman led. I am a force to be reckoned with on the front lines. It's not always glamorous, it's not always easy, it's actually very tiring, but it has been an incredible journey and will continue to be an incredible journey. in a mixed race family and you talk publicly about the discrimination that you faced in school and in your neighborhood growing up. One of my earliest memories is actually um, when I was about five or six years old being beaten up in a bathroom by some other kid who then called me the n-word. Like, I can't remember anything earlier than that and that is something that, that still impacts me to this day. You also grew up in Orlando, Florida, which is 15 minutes from Sanford, where Trayvon Martin was killed in 2012. I saw myself in Trayvon Martin. You know, I was a kid who, I would take the city bus home. The city bus would drop me off about a mile away from my house. And I would walk that mile every single day after school. And that's what happened to Trayvon Martin. He was stopped by George Zimmerman, and then the criminal justice system didn't do anything to hold George Zimmerman accountable. So that was the last straw for me.
What is the importance of data in the fight for racial justice? In 2014, Ferguson happened, the uprising in Ferguson. This was one of these sort of flashpoint moments where the nation became focused on police violence. It became clear that there was very little data produced by the federal government to help us understand this problem. For me, that meant that first we needed to get the data, and so that's what I did. You know, I built Mapping Police Violence. It's a map that quite simply visualizes um, people who are killed by police. The goal is to demonstrate that this is indeed a nationwide problem that requires a systemic solution. You've been working to reduce racial injustice for a while now. Have there been any personal costs to you? Absolutely. My work is literally um, compiling, reading through, analyzing, and figuring out how to tell a story about cases of people who have been killed by the police and otherwise harmed by the police. It's hard in part because these are lives. Um, these are people, these are human beings who have families and communities. So there have also been physical threats as well, right? So, you know, I've had the FBI show up at my door. Then I was starting to get threats, uh, messages, emails. As a young black man in this work, like, I'm constantly up against institutions and systems that are much more powerful. And yet, you know, time and time again, I'm reminded that this work still remains important. That's why the work uh, has to continue. Samuel and Chelsea, thank you so much for being here today. The first question I'd like to ask both of you, do you think our generation is more politically active than the generations before? And how are our approaches different? I disagree with the fact that we're more politically active this generation. If you look at history, then you know, even the civil rights movement, there were young leaders who are on the front lines for that as well. John Lewis was 23 when he spoke on the March on Washington. Martin Luther King organized at a very young age. I think what we're seeing now is in the midst, right, of a digital age where social media is so easily at everyone's disposal that it is a toolkit in ways that we haven't seen before historically to democratize information to share resources and ultimately to build community. And I think that's what happened this past summer with the George Floyd protest. But I also think that that is really indicative of the power of community building and coalition building that we're seeing with the Gen Z and millennial generations. Okay. So just to be clear, you're saying that our generation is not more politically active. But what we are doing is we're using digital tools to, tools to organize in ways that generations before didn't have the opportunity. Absolutely. To, correct? Samuel, how would you respond to that? Yeah, I, I agree. You know, wholeheartedly with that. I think you look just at the sheer number of protests um, that occurred since the Ferguson uprising in 2014 and then again um, after the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis. It's at a scale that this nation has never seen before. You know, we have, in terms of organizing, you know, we're learning from organizers all across the world who are figuring out how to use limited resources, um, but access to technologies, access to a phone, access to Twitter that just allow us to go further, to go faster, to organize more quickly and at a scale that hasn't been possible. What is digital organizing then? Digital organizing is how do we actually um, mobilize and align uh, people's skills, their talent, their energy, um, and the, their concern about this issue with actions that can make the biggest difference towards ending police violence, towards changing the systems and structures that reproduce police violence in cities across the country. And Chelsea, how are you using that in your work? Digital organizing is how Freedom March NYC came to be, right? It was through a friend and I coming together and saying that there wasn't enough organized protests taking place in New York City, but then it's trans translating that into action items. So whether that be signing petitions, whether that be getting people to come on the ground, whether that be sharing and disseminating information, which is really important, especially in the age of misinformation. And so we had our online classes, we had virtual trainings, we had seminars, we had panels. Um, and so it was through that sharing of information that ultimately led to the spread of Freedom March NYC and us growing so rapidly during the summer. You brought up misinformation, so let's Let's touch on that a little bit. While technology and social media has made it easier for us to mobilize, but it has also led to an increased polarization in the country. How do you deal with the distrust in facts? One is sort of radical transparency. So, you know, in my work since 2014, it really has been focused on collecting, analyzing, and um, storytelling using data. 
um, to better understand the issue of police violence across the country. Um, where are sort of the hot spots of police violence? Uh, where are the places that are actually making progress towards reducing police violence? Um, and then what are some of the policy and systemic changes that can be effective uh, in reducing police shootings, police use of force, racial disparities in policing? And in the context of that work, you, know, you mentioned misinformation. There are a set of, I'll call them myths, um, and this is disinformation, it's myth misinformation, but it predates um, sort of the new round of sort of social media. What are these myths? Can you name? So I think there are a set of myths around policing that have been around for centuries um, and really trace back to slavery, right? This idea of black criminality, this idea that the police are not doing anything wrong, they're merely encountering people who are inherently violent in inherently violent places, which are often code words, um, which are racist code words. Um, that narrative is pernicious. It exists across the political spectrum. Um, and so part of it is how do we use the tools available to us, data, um, data visualization, organizing, uh, policy making, to effectively and directly dismantle those myths? Because ultimately, these myths have power. The history of our current policing institution was that it was initially created as a slave catching institution. And so, when we talk about undoing so many years, right, of systemic racism, when we talk about the fact that the civil rights movement truthfully never ended, it has just taken on a different form. Understanding the data is important, but also understanding that there, of course, is that intentionality, right, to suppress information. And there is a reason for that. Chelsea, what is defunding the police? This idea idea around defunding the police, let's be very clear, it's a spectrum. It's not a yes or no um, conversation, especially because defund the NYPD has literally been used as a sensationalizing way to really polarize the country. Um, and in reality, when you kind of break down what defunding the police really means is reallocating police resources, reallocating community resources. Yeah. There is an urgent need to reimagine public safety and to dramatically shift um, how we approach public safety away from the po a policing-based approach and towards uh, investing in a community-based approach mm -hmm. that is not a, a, a not responding to communities with violence. What are the new ways of imagining safety that you know our generation are talking about? It's how do we protect our communities and what does it look like to envision a place right, where we take the resources that are ultimately present in deeming our young people as criminal and putting that money and that funding into resources for our education institutions and putting that money into health care, right? And so for us to really understand this, it's first and foremost to understand the history, it's to understand tracing of, of the money, right, and the budget, especially in New York with a lot of the work that we did this past summer around the conversations around defunding NYPD, defunding the police, which really just translates to how do we make sure that we're putting the resources back into our communities. Just yes. to get a scale of how big, I want yes. people to know what does a police budget look like in different cities. The total amount of money spent on the police is about $11 billion spent on the NYPD each year, um, which is the most of any local law enforcement agency in the country. Um, but, you know, city across city, police departments are a huge expenditure. So in places like Oakland, it can be up to 40% of the city's general fund um, that is spent on policing, um, which far eclipses the amount of money spent on, let's say, uh, um, you know, youth jobs programs, uh, investments in mental health uh, uh, as a response to mental health crises, and the types of things that are actually you know, far better approaches that are not violent approaches to some of the issues that police are currently responding to. Only about 4% of the total amount of time an officer spends on a typical shift is responding to violent crime. So again, what police are spending their resources doing is not about responding to violent crime. It's not about keeping people safe from harm. Uh, it is about a whole host of other things that are not about public safety and that actually, um, to your point, exacerbate the problem. Um, it, respond with violence to people who are going through, are going through struggles, are going uh, through poverty, are going through homelessness, are going through mental health crises. This is something where we need to reimagine what the response to these issues is. Um, but to get there, we have to debunk and dismantle on this myth that police as an institution exists to keep people safe because the data just simply doesn't support that. How can you fix it in the immediate? 
in the immediate, it looks like answering the, the call to action that so many people have been saying since this past summer, and truth be told, for such a long time. It looks like thinking about how do we have more programs like what's being scaled and bringing mental health um, professionals on the ground with police officers. It looks like perhaps completely, right, not having police officers be the first response to every situation that takes place, but having the opportunity to call health professionals and them coming in. It looks like funding adequately our education systems, right? All of these things are very tangible next steps that we can take. And really, what we're asking for is a reimagining of how do we go about addressing the needs of our communities and doing so in a way that pushes the conversation forward. And there's nothing radical about that. Is there data then to prove that defunding the police is more effective? What we can show with the data is that there are cities that have begun to pilot alternative responses to some of the things that police traditionally have responded to. In LA, uh, they actually are piloting a co-responder program, which is um, not as good as having just a mental health provider, but this is the mental health provider sort of takes the lead, the police play back up, and they sort of sit back. What is interesting about the program is the LA Sheriff's Department, which, which runs the program in, in collaboration with the county mental health providers, um, they actually put out a report last year where they reviewed the program and they admitted, the sheriff's department admitted, that they would have used force an additional 600 more times and they would have shot four more people if there hadn't have been a mental health provider on the scene de-escalating the situation. And that's the police saying that, right? So you can imagine the truth is probably a lot, fur a lot, a lot further along than that. Chelsea, you spoke about how George Floyd's death had an impact on the nation, but also on you personally. His death isn't the first awful case of police brutality in this country. So I will definitely say that George Floyd is not the first, right? Neither is Trayvon Martin. But what I will say is that when we understand George Floyd and his death, we also have to paint that within the context of what happened, right? There was a pandemic that had a lot of people on their phones, and that was the main way of you receiving information on a day-to-day -day basis. And so I think it created a shockwave effect where everyone was forced to see you know, when I think back to 2014 and 15 in the context of the Ferguson uprising, so much of that work was necessarily focused on proving that there was a systemic problem. Um, and not because folks who had experienced it didn't know there was a systemic problem, really because there were a lot of white people who refused to believe it, um, and a lot of policymakers who refused to act on it. And I think when the George Floyd video came out, there was also something about that video in particular, the number of officers who were there, sort of the cold stare on Derek Chauvin's face. He really was indifferent to George Floyd's life. There was something about that incident in particular that I think um, hit a different chord. There was now consensus that there was a problem, that it was systemic, that it was everywhere. Can I say something to that, Sam? I would say that we definitely did see a shift, but I would actually push back in saying that on a large scale, this was the conversation because, in fact, I feel like the election results told a completely different story. It showed the fact that there was a divisive um, nature when it came to what happened with George Floyd, because truth be told, if the George Floyd um, death was enough, then we should have seen a large, a landslide win for Biden, at the very least, to denounce Trump's administration. Another thing that I would add is that six years ago with Ferguson, we didn't have a president that was going on Twitter talking about, you know, there's hoodlums in the streets that are organizing protests and demonstrations, and, you know, we need to send the National Guard in. Six years ago, we weren't in the middle of a pandemic. And six years ago, we didn't have a president who went on a debate telling Proud Boys to stand by and stand back. And so the reality Proud is— Proud Boys are a white supremacy group. Yes, so I think it's important for us to understand that this past summer was in a lot of ways a boiling of incidents and a boiling of trauma. My question to you, Sam, is do you think data can help bridge that divide? I mean, I've seen it bridge the divide. Um, and I think data is a really important tool for dismantling the myths that white people have told themselves that make them comfortable about the status quo. Um, and frankly, I think we have to talk about data in the context of white supremacy, because one of the reasons that policymakers, researchers, and a whole lot of folks in communities of power and privilege respect data so much 
is that they actually dismiss the stories of community members um, in lieu of data. But I don't think that we should be deluded into thinking that there are so many more people who, if they just saw this thing, would think differently. There have been reports after reports, investigation after investigation. Um, if you don't believe that there is a systemic issue in policing still, uh, I think it is going to be extremely difficult, if not impossible, to convince you. I think the question is how do we mobilize the critical mass of people who we already have on our side mm -hmm. to actually implement those changes I don't think, I think we could implement all the transformational changes that we need. It's about how do we mobilize over 100 million people consistently and in a way that is coordinated and directed exactly at the places to make the biggest difference. Mm -hmm. I really want to emphasize something that Sam said. We cannot be deluded into believing that data alone is going to fix everything. It's not. Data needs to be paired with also the humanity element and understanding stories and narratives. And we also have to be intentional about what is needed within a given movement and how we can respond in a way that really pushes the conversation forward. I'm asking you both, are there any people or movements internationally that inspire you and inspire your work? From Hong Kong to Palestine to Brazil um, to Nigeria, like we're seeing uh, movements against state violence um, encountering similar tactics, the tear gas and the repression, um, and having to problem solve in real time with not only sort of domestically or internally, but internationally with other people who have gone through similar struggles, who've experienced similar things. In the space of police data, most countries actually collect better data on policing than the United States does. Um, and we learn more about our ourselves by examining some of the data internationally. Um, so for example, we know that the United States has uh, one of the highest rates of police violence among sort of wealthy um, Western nations. That isn't unique to the United States, right? This is all across um, the Americas. Mm -hmm. That has been sort of the function of policing in societies that were constructed on slavery and, and on um, the genocide of indigenous peoples. And we're seeing in Brazil right now um, large-scale protests in response to police violence. Brazil has the highest rate of police violence in the entire world. 6,000 people are killed by police every single year. About 80% of people killed by police in Brazil are black. Um, and it is exceedingly hard to collect data on those cases. Um, so part of sort of this knowledge sharing is um, figuring out how to find those records, how to compile those stories um, so that local organizers can use that in their organizing work. Chelsea, which are movements of people internationally that inspire your work? I think that there is a lot of ground that we've made within the U.S., but also there's a lot of conversations on a global scale that needs to be had around policing. And so I think about NSARS because that's something that is so closely connected to the work that we've been doing on the front lines. SARS is a form of police within in Nigeria that um, focuses on essentially trying to end robberies, right? And so they do that by targeting particularly young people who either look like they have money, perhaps are suspicious, et cetera. But really what it boils down to is profiling and using that as a way to justify over-policing to justify killing people without any type of accountability. And so a lot of young folks have answered the call to action of saying no more. So for us, it's really important to make sure that we are supporting these movements as they are happening and we are being intentional about those calls to actions that are coming out of them. Okay. Our generation is usually considered as a generation that is unwilling to work within systems if they don't fit our demands. How do you define your work within that context, and what is your end goal? So I would definitely say that, yes, we are a generation that works outside of systems, but I would say that we are a generation that is multifaceted and can do both. And so specifically with the work of Freedom March NYC, we not only focus on protests, but we also do policy work. So we have our Five to Freedom policy platform that focuses on getting cops out of classrooms. We also are on the front lines. And so I think it's really important to understand that ultimately it is the people that will push institutions and systems to be better, but in that same way that if we do not show up in those systems, then we create opportunities for those who do not share our same beliefs and for those who ultimately are um, okay with the status quo to make decisions about our lives. And so that is why we have to be intentional about showing up everywhere. I think that we are a generation that calls BS. I think that we're a generation that holds folks accountable, and we are also a generation that is not afraid to change the game if the current one isn't working. 
So I think uh, we're a generation that doesn't wait for permission. I think if the problems that we are facing are so profound. The inequities um, economically, politically, socially, um, that we just can't wait. Like the institutions aren't going to save us. The government isn't going to save us. Um, there's no, you know, anointed leader who's going to save us. This is life or death for us, for our family members, for our generation. And I think we have to, we have been rising to that moment. We will continue to rise uh, to that challenge. Um, because ultimately, I think we do need to reimagine everything. We need to reimagine society, our institutions. We can't keep operating. I mean, the United States is a 21st century country running on a 1700s operating system. Um, and it's just, it's not a system that is acceptable. It's not the system that we deserve. And I think we have the tools at our disposal to change it. Absolutely. Samuel and Chelsea, thank you so much for joining me. It's been a fascinating talk. Thank you. Thank you.